Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Saratech Enablement Series. My name is Rebecca Stuchetz from the Marketing Department here at Saratech, and I will be your host. Presenting today, we have Andrew Carlson, who is a Team Center Applications Engineer, and he'll be talking to you about Team Center part numbering and management. And so with that, I will pass the baton to Andrew. Thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. I appreciate it. So as uh, Rebecca said, I'm Andrew Carlson, uh, Team Center Applications Engineer, and I've been with Saratech for about the last year working exclusively with Team Center. Uh, and the topic today, uh, as Rebecca said, is going to involve Team Center items, item types, attributes, and naming rules. Um, and so let's get into it. So on the agenda, we're going to have a discussion. We're going to talk about why we're talking about this, first of all. Why are naming rules and attributes important? to Team Center, to our business. Um, we're then gonna look at items and parts, which are interchangeable um, as data containers. So what you can do with your items, um, as we'll see, Team Center comes with default items, uh, but you can customize those to further meet your needs as an organization. Um, we're then gonna look at using attributes to define data, which is extremely helpful, and I think a little underused, honestly, uh, to, to help searches um, be more efficient and uh, search results to be more accurate. Um, standard naming rules is what we'll get into next, and this will kind of cover the IDs associated with Team Center objects and how they can be customized to uh, also fit your needs and to be displayed in a manner that's easy for everyone to understand what that data uh, actually pertains to. We're then going to look at intelligent naming capabilities. And this is something that is a little bit more complex, but it allows organizations to take different elements of their business. Uh, if they have different suppliers, different vendors, um, if they have different facilities they're working at and whatnot, uh, and actually integrate that into a part number. Um, and throughout the entire discussion, we're gonna look at searching for data and how that's uh, really made easier by implementing some of these elements of Team Center. So let's start by talking about what items are. Um, why are we why are we discussing these uh, item naming rules and attributes? Um, first of all, organization of data is huge. That's basically the essential reason why we have Team Center. Um, and so, being able to see similar types of data is extremely important. And item types allow us to do that, as well as naming rules. If we have a, a name that is similar uh, to the, the parts that we're creating, if we know that it pertains to a rocket uh, instead of a car, for instance, which we'll see in examples that follow, uh, that's gonna help us organize data more efficiently. Also speed and efficiency of searches. This is a huge one. We can customize searches to enable us to have accurate search results and quickly find the products and parts that we are making and we're using um, if we are, are using attributes. Uh, and that's an extremely, extremely important aspect of Team Center. We're also able to uh, harness the ability to to keep our data secure uh, by using different uh, part types. And this is done through projects in Team Center, but you can actually segregate who can view certain part types based on the project that they're in. So you can use part types to essentially uh, make your items more secure. It also eliminates rework. Um, uh, if you are using attributes effectively, you can essentially do away with a lot of rework that would have to be done uh, when users enter um, different aspects of a part. So whether that's a volume or a color or some type of part type, uh, they, they have to enter in these strings and that can create a risk for rework down the line. Whereas the uh, if you have certain attributes that have drop down menus and selectable items, this can mitigate that rework in the future. Um, and also mapping across CAD systems. We also, we, obviously Team Center has a dearth of different CAD uh, operating systems that it works with. And so uh, mapping is, is uh, essential and it's, it's done with attributes through CAD software uh, across platforms as we'll see. So in talking about this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually be going into uh, two sides of things. I'm gonna be talking about it from a business aspect and also from more uh, a more, uh, tech user aspect and administrator aspect. So on the user side, we see that, you know, we have a rich client, which is Team Center's main interface, uh, and then Active Workspace, which I would say is the more uh, recent development and new age version of Team Center that a lot of companies are using right now. 
Um, and th that's the user side of things. On the administrator side of things, we both we, we will be configuring in rich client and active workspace as administrators, but we'll also be using something called the BM IDE, which is the essential code that structures um, what the users see in active in in Team Center, uh, and the style sheets, which is actually how you uh, format the code that you are writing and that you're configuring, so that users can see it in the way they expect to. And so I'll be showing a couple different aspects here, or some on the administrative side and the how-to sections, as you'll see. So the first element that I want to talk about is what is an item? And obviously, if you've used Team Center, you know that an item is the fundamental object under which all of your data is essentially attached. Uh, this includes all sorts of data sets from CAD software, uh, CAD, CAD files to your Microsoft Office files, Visio files, uh, JPEGs, whatever it is. This is all contained underneath an item. It's the basic storage facility for your data. Um, and when you create an item, the common information that's seen on this is an ID, a name, an item type, and a description. And as you see there in the example uh, lower middle, um, you see that we have an ID, a very uh, simplistic number ID on this item, and the name is grid. Uh, and then you have an item revision right underneath that, where all of that data is, is uh, contained. And that item revision obviously is revised as you go about your work and continue to add and modify things. So when we wanna organize data in Team Center, what's helpful is that we can actually create custom part types. Uh, and this can segregate our data more efficiently so that we know what we're actually working with in terms of uh, what products we're working on. So as you can see here in both the rich client and active workspace in this example, We've configured custom item types to uh, be displayed to the users, including electric bikes, rockets, and cars. So we know now if we are making a part uh, that has to do with our rocket group, well, we can go and use the rocket part, um, likewise with the other two. And so in Team Center by default, you only have that lower item icon there, um, but this is customized through the BMIDE, which I can show. So, this is the administrative side of things and how you would go about configuring this. And I wanted to touch upon this because, uh, you know, we have administrators and business folks alike that, that are taking part in this. And so this is a helpful aspect. But um, in creating this, you would actually go into the BMIDE and you would select the part um, uh, workspace object. And then you would actually right click and say that you want to make a new one uh, and give it a name. And now the name pertains to the code that's going to be used. Uh, the display name is what the user sees. So in the previous example, we had cars here. And as you see, the display name is cars as well. So that's what the user would see. And then you create, uh, you hit finish, and that's that's about it. It's a pretty simple uh, process to make a part type. So naming rules. Let's talk about those for, for a couple minutes. Naming rules define the data entry format for business object properties. So we have, uh, the, the, and naming rules can be associated to many different business objects. As you see here on the left, items and item revisions, they can have separate naming rules. Uh, obviously you're gonna have an item revision naming rule, which takes the form of maybe a one, two, three, or an ABC. Uh, data sets, forms, projects, these can all have separate uh, naming rules associated with them, oops. And what's really cool is you can uh, configure naming rules to include groups, roles, user IDs, site IDs. So if you have one group that's always making a certain item, you can actually integrate uh, their group name into the, the name of the item uh, if that so suits your needs. And as you see here in the example, um, in this blue box, we have here just a, a basic naming rule with three Cs followed by six uh, digits. And these count from uh, 00001 up to all nines uh, over the sequence of time. And so that's a pretty simplistic one. And we can see that uh, we can do a lot with our simple naming rules. And I say simple, uh, they're not intelligent in the sense that they're taking different aspects from, um, they're not configured to take from a pull down of different aspects of the company. These are going to be set characteristics on the name itself. So you would always see in, for example, this, this top object here, 200 CC dash, you would always see the CC dash and you might also always see the 200 CC dash depending on how it is uh, configured in the BMIDE, but you could also integrate counters in the here. And so this allows you to organize similar data. 
which you wouldn't necessarily be able to do with an out of the box naming rule, as you see on the bottom there, which is just a, a straight counter in Team Center. Um, and that's just going to be a number. So you wouldn't necessarily know that you're working on perhaps a rocket part compared to some other part or, or what have you uh, if it's not in the name. And so this can help people when they first see the name to uh, understand what they're working with. So how you would create a naming rule in the, the BMIDE is uh, it's much like you would create a part type like we just showed, um, but you would go in and, and go under extensions, find your naming rules folder, right click it and create a new naming rule. And as you see here, there's a pattern uh, that you have to list and this can be structured in in very many different ways. You can have uh, counters, like I was saying, uh, mixed in with different characters and strings, um, and you can integrate all different types of symbols as well, uh, really whatever fits your need. Um, but again, it's not intelligent in the sense that it's not taking from, you know, a drop down of different facilities that you'd be working with, as we'll see a little later on. But that being said, you can search on these naming rules uh, just as easily and they're very easy to configure. They don't take a very long time. So one of the biggest and most important aspects of um, team center data management is utilizing attributes. And I think this is underused, honestly, in a lot of companies. Um, but attributes are essentially another way of structuring the name of your item. Um, you can search on attributes so, so easily in team center. And you can structure your searches so that you don't have to go on endless goose chases for your for your products and your and your parts. Um, and as we see here, I, attributes are typically held on item revisions. So you're going to be revising parts, and you want those attributes normally to carry over from revision to revision, uh, so that they so that they appear on all of your new parts. Um, and there's virtually no limit to how many attributes you can put on an item revision. And so this kind of helps you again really filter down. Uh, searches for your for your data and uh, and keep a plethora of information um, pertaining to it um, and and again as you see on the right hand side this big example here these are all pull down menus that allow you to uh, they they allow you to um, not have to to, to erroneously enter uh, strings or characters uh, when you're entering attribute items so you know instead of entering car it's a pull down that you press car. Um, and so that, that makes it a little bit easier to not have to go back and rework certain things if they get released down the process um, and you find out that an attribute was entered incorrectly. This can help mitigate that. Uh, and again, facilitates accurate search results as we've been discussing. So it's very helpful to utilize attributes heavily on your items and your parts um, as this really just makes for an efficient and standardized uh, uh, kind of methodology for your business. So CAD integration with attributes, um, this is obviously something that's very important when you do have custom attributes on your items in Team Center, you want them to carry over uh, to your CAD applications. So whether that's SolidWorks or NX or what have you, uh, in this example, it's NX, but we've configured here, as you see um, in these boxes, there's actually custom attributes that are in NX that are linked to Team Center. And you can do this in one of three ways, really. You can have, uh, you can have modifiable attributes in NX where you put the uh, the users will put the values in while they're in NX and then they'll be seen in Team Center or they can put them in in Team Center and they'll be seen in NX. Um, really, it's it's cross transfer data. So you can do it uh, those two ways or either either way um, and have it linked. So uh, it's very useful and attributes can be uh, mapped. In, in a variety of different CAD applications, as you can see here, uh, we've got CATIA, Pro Engineer, Solid Edge, SolidWorks. There's many others not on this list. Um, and then also you can integrate with eCAD systems such as Mentor Graphics and Cadence. Um, and then again, there's others on here, but uh, really the the gist of it is mapping is a huge aspect of Team Center that really helps you to maintain that standardization across your platform. So again, searching for data. Um, searching for data is made so easy using attributes. What you would do is go in to uh, your query builder and you would actually just configure the attributes that you've created on your item to match what you want to look for. 
And so in this example, we see here a general search is going to be composed of a name, a description, type, owning user, yada, yada, yada. Uh, but if you wanted those to be volume and color um, and radius and whatever it is, you could have a, a custom search with custom attributes there and they would have drop downs as well so that you wouldn't have to actually enter in what attribute you're searching for you could just select it from a drop down as you would do when filling out the original attribute so this again really increases the speed of inefficiency of uh locating your data which i think is one of the the largest problems people have uh, with data management is is obviously that location and and ease of finding it and so how do you create attributes well Attributes are created much the same way. Uh, you would actually go onto your part, your custom part. So here we have our custom part cars. And on the, uh, in the BMIDE, when you select that, you'll have a properties tab that pops up. Uh, when you select that, you can press add and it will come up with a dialog box that allows you to fill in the type of property that you wanna create. And properties and attributes are uh, synonymous with each other here. So when you get to that dialog box, you'll have the opportunity to say, uh, okay, I want a persistent property, which is uh, that it remains constant on the object or a runtime property, which is derived each time the property is displayed um, or a compound property, which essentially ties two properties together. So if you wanna take a property from a different object, let's say you wanted to route a property from, um, uh, well, a user ID or something into your item, you could do that using a compound property. Uh, and then there's relation type properties as well. And as you can see on this example on the right with a persistent property, you have the ability to choose what type um, of attribute you, you are actually creating, whether that's an integer or a string um, uh, or a date, you can actually add dates as well. So there's, there's a plethora of different options here. And again, it's really just as helping you to standardize things and uh, make your items concise and, um, and easy to search for. So taking a step back, just quick review, what we've gone over so far are part types and attributes. Uh, we've also gone over naming rules, which um, are helpful in determining what data we're looking at. But part types uh, are obviously one way of segregating the data that we want. Um, and, and then attributes are kind of making elements of that data and uh, being able to distinguish between even further filter out what data we're looking at. So now I'll jump into an example of intelligent part numbering. So let's say we have an example where uh, a company, well, a company has several different uh, facilities all over the world, Americas, Europe, China, um, and they want to make a more descriptive object uh, through, through their IDs. Um, they want users to be able to look them up and identify characteristics of the items. Um, well, we can configure this in the BMIDE so that uh, users can see what parts they're working with um, and kind of in a coded fashion, see if they know the code, they can know what part they're working with and where it derives from, what facility it's touched um, and, and the like. So. The use case for such an example, and obviously this works in larger companies, um, but a company has a design center, uh, has design centers in departments, uh, as you'll see, such as body shop and paint shop spread across their businesses. And the two product lines, commercial vehicles and passenger vehicles, is what they're using. Um, and they have thousands of parts designed at various business uh, unit locations and departments. And the company wants the item IDs for each part to convey that unit product line and department as well as uh, whether that part was manufactured in-house or bought from a supplier. So we're gonna do a simplistic version of this uh, just to show you what it would look like. And obviously there are limitations with this that I will get into. Uh, so it's not to be used um, heavily, I would say among companies, but this is one element that can be helpful uh, for larger businesses. So elements of intelligent part numbers. Uh, as you see here, we have the example where we would like a pull down menu for the unit that's going to be displayed when we're creating a new item. Uh, and then we'll have a separate one for product line, department, and whether it's a make or buy. Um, and then we'll have that uh, counter at the end there that also is tied into the previous attributes that we're putting on this item ID. So in this example here, we have something built in the Americas 
It's from uh, the product line, passenger vehicles, um, and it's it's in the body shop uh, department. And then it has a counter because it's in the Americas between 8,001 and uh, 9999. So that's what we're looking at in this example. So how would we go about creating the intelligent part numbers in the background? Before I get into a demonstration on how it looks in the user interface, uh, what you would do here, it's very involved actually. Um, so you'd have to create a base ID generator, uh, an ID generator um, that just stores what ID you're going to be creating, and that's going to hold its own properties. So as you see, this is, these properties aren't going to be tied to the item or item revision or part or part revision that you're creating in Team Center. It's tied to an ID generator. So they're not actually stored on that part revision. Um, and this can be confusing for people to understand, but it means that you're not going to be allowed to search on these properties unless they're also redundantly placed on those item revisions as their own properties. Um, you would create a list of values that would be attached to these properties and then uh, any conditions associated. So let's say that you wanted the pull down, if it's built in the Americas, in this example, I want it to say, or if it's, if it's a make, I want it to say Americas. You can have that as a condition so that when a user in their pull down menu says make, uh, then the Americas is, is the next in line. When it, when it generates the ID, Americas is what's gonna be shown. Um, you create concatenation rules, which obviously dictates the order of these elements and how it's uh, displayed to the user, uh, and attach these concatenation rules to the item ID property, uh, and then save and deploy the template. So this is on the administrative side, what you would do to configure this. And I'm not going to go into that here because it's very in-depth, but um, just know that it takes time and, and a lot of effort to configure. So with that, I'll jump into a short demonstration of how this would look in the rich client. So here we're looking at Team Center uh, and we're standing on our home tab. If we go file new item, we'll see we have several different item types here. Well, we want to create a car. So we're going to say cars and we're going to say next. And as you see here, typically you would only see ID, revision, name, description, and then there might be some other type of item revision information down there below. But I've actually added in this section for ID generator configuration. And this entails all that we need to create our, our intelligent part number. So what's required here is a name, and we'll give it a name of gasket. And then we'll select from our drop-down menus here. So let's say we wanted the make to be Honda. Um, we wanted the model to be an Accord. The location, North America, department, paint shop. Well, now we can hit finish. And we actually put a counter on that as well. So that at the end here, as you see, we have a Honda Accord, North America, paint shop, and then a counter from 1,000 that counts up. Um, and so obviously this is the second part that I've made or third part, uh, if you will. So it has a tube uh, and then the name gasket with it. So as you can see, that's how we've kind of created this intelligent part number. Now this out of the box obviously is, is uh, just a number. It would just be uh, an ID number, right? And so you can see how this can be more helpful in terms of identifying what part we're working with. Um, and how I was able to configure that creation dialog to display those properties is actually through style sheets. And I'll talk about style sheets here for one moment. So if we look at the style sheet that we used, this style sheet right here, this displays what we saw when we created that car item. So as you remember, we had a make and we had a location, we had department, and then we had our different model types pertaining to the make. So what we've done here is we've just created uh, our custom style sheet, and then we've gone in and placed the names, which are the, the code names of those attributes, and we've placed them on the style sheet so that when a user creates this car, they're given that uh, those drop-down options, and those are used to create the item ID. So that's essentially how you would go about creating this. So let me jump back in real quick to the presentation. 
And I want to discuss real quick the limitations of intelligent parts, because obviously this looks, you know, fine and dandy and it's it's got a lot of uh, bells and whistles to it. But um, at the end of the day, as I was saying, it's not tied to attributes on the actual item you're creating. So if you want to search for those elements, unless you know what you're looking for in the quick search, it's very difficult to find uh, your exact your exact part. So it's helpful to have attributes on the items, as you see. Um, so that you can search for parts more easily. Um, intelligent part numbers are not integratable with all types of CAD software. So there may be limitations there as well um, that you have to be aware of. Whereas naming rules for the most part uh, are integratable with CAD software, intelligent part numbers may not be, and it can cause issues. Uh, it, again, with the attributes, it can cause confusion and redundancy. So if you do have attributes you want to put on the intelligent part number, um, there's going to be redundancy in entries because you're going to have to make those attributes twice, one to create the ID and one to be stored on the item after it's created. Um, and again, this is a much more time consuming and costly configuration. And, and it can be very useful for large companies, as I said, that have a lot of different elements uh, to their business that they're trying to integrate into a single ID name. Um, but there are there are very many limitations as well. Hey, Andrew. Yes. So we just received a question and it's can you create an intelligent part number from an X? Uh, I believe that you can. Um, but I will have to get back to you on that. I believe that the answer is yes. Great, great, thank you. That's a good question. Um, so notable takeaways here from this section. Uh, we've dealt with naming rules, obviously, including our intelligent naming rules, um, and we've dealt with attributes. And so really what it comes down to is how do we wanna group and organize our data? Um, how do we want that data to be displayed? Um, what's easiest for us as users um, to be able to find our data, right? We wanna be able to find it very quickly and effectively. Um, and how do we standardize that data so that it all looks the same when we're dealing with the same parts, the same components. Um, all of this is just leading to less work in the future, less uh, error uh, on the user side, uh, more time saved and uh, at the bottom line, more money uh, garnished for our company as we continue to mitigate costs with uh, the accumulating risk of, of you know, incorrect entries um, and searches that take too long. And these can really add up over time. So it's helpful to uh, mitigate those through attributes, intelligent, well, through attributes, naming rules and, and part types. And obviously if your company uh, desires an intelligent ID, they can do that. Um, but uh, that is that is all I had for today. So uh, thank you for coming and joining. And uh, I can take any questions as well if there are any residuals. All right, thank you, Andrew. Um, looks like there are no more questions in the chat box. So uh, we hope you all enjoyed this session. And if you're ready to take it to the next level, Saratech offers much more than software. We have a wide variety of options, uh, as you can see, for training, services, and 3D printers. Um, if you have any questions about that, you can email us at marketing at .com. And please be sure to subscribe to our channel or follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn for upcoming webinar dates and topics. So thank you so much for attending. Andrew, thank you again for presenting and have a great day. Thanks for checking out our channel. If you like what you saw, make sure to like and subscribe down below so you don't miss out on any new videos. Follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter for the latest engineering news and information. And to see all of our upcoming events, please visit our website at saratech.com events.